Hi and welcome. In the previous part of this tutorial on c -sharp exception handling, we looked at creating a custom exception and we also looked at handling arguments exceptions. In this tutorial, we'll look at logging information about exceptions to a text file. Recording exception information in a text file can be very useful for troubleshooting an application when the application is being developed and also after the application has been released into the production environment. Please like, subscribe, share and comment to support the channel, it will be greatly appreciated. Right, now that we have one method to handle the formatting and writing of exception messages to the console screen, let's tidy up the code and the catch blocks in the main method by replacing the current code which is being repeated in all the catch blocks in the main method with a call to the write exception message to screen method, which has been specifically created to consolidate writing exception messages in a specific format to the console screen in one method. At the moment, the way we are handling our exceptions is by writing an informative message to the user when a specific exception occurs. But it is also useful to build exception logging functionality into an application to help with troubleshooting issues that can occur both during the development of the application and also after the application has been released into the production environment. So one way to do this is by logging exception information to a text file. Depending on the requirement, you could also choose to log exception information to, for example, a database table. You could also include code to notify predefined personnel through an email if deemed necessary. Email notifications could be useful, for example, if a specific exception needs urgent attention. But we are going to keep things simple and implement exception logging functionality by writing exception information to a text file. So let's build a class responsible for logging information to a text file. Let's add a class to our project and name it Logger. Let's make this class a public static class. Let's create an enum and name it log type. The log type enum can be used in code to indicate how much detail should be logged when a specific exception is handled. So the enum has two items. The first item is named basic. The second item is named verbose. The item named basic will serve as an indicator that we choose to log a minimal amount of information to our log file about the exception. And the second item named verbose will serve as an indicator that we choose to log more detailed information than just basic information to our log file. Right, so let's create a method named log. The method must be static because it is a member of a static class. So we must include the static keyword in the method definition. The method does not return a value, so we must include the void keyword in the method definition. This method accepts one argument which is of the string data type. This argument will contain text to be logged to a log file. So before we write codes to log this text to a text file, let's first define two member variables. The first member variable is a read-only string and is named logpath. So we want to create our log file in the same directory as where our application resides. So we can do this by using the appdomain.currentdomain.base directory property to get a string value containing the directory path where our application resides. The second member variable we need to declare is of type streamwriter, and we are going to use an object of type streamwriter to append text to our log file. Note the streamwriter class is a member of the system.io namespace. Let's name this variable underscore log file. So let's create our log method. Let's first instantiate an object of type streamwriter. I'm going to give the variable names an underscore prefix so they are recognizable as member variables. Let's pass a concatenated string containing the directory path and the name of the log file as an argument to the constructor of the streamwriter class. The second parameter of the constructor of the streamwriter class accepts a boolean value. We are going to pass in true as an argument which signifies that we want the text passed into the log method to be appended to the relevant log file. So when the text is logged, it will not overwrite our log file. The relevant text will be added to the end of the file. If the log file does not exist, code within the streamwriter class will create the log file for us. So we can then call the writeLine method on the object of the streamwriter type 
to log text to our log file. So let's include a date timestamp preceding each text item written to the log file. Let's go back to our main method and let's write code to log the data stored in the stack trace property of the relevant court exception object, in this case the calculation result overflow exception object. Note that we do not have to instantiate an object for the logger class because the logger class is a static class. So when an overflow exception occurs as a result of an operation between two integer operands, the stack trace information for the calculation result overflow exception object will now be captured in our log file. Note the stack trace information contains information about the files containing our code and the lines of code traversed when the stack unwinds as a result of an exception occurring. When I say the stack unwinds, I mean if for example, you have the main method that calls method one, then method one calls method two. Note that each of these methods on the stack is denoted by a stack frame. So if for example, an exception occurs in method two, the common language runtime will seek an appropriate catch block within method two. If the exception is not handled in method two, the common language runtime will try to find a catch block in method one to handle the exception. If method one does not contain an appropriate catch block to handle the exception, the common language runtime will try to find a catch block within the main method to handle the exception. If an appropriate catch block does not exist in the main method, this exception will be deemed as an unhandled exception and the common language runtime will handle the exception. If however an appropriate catch block exists within one of the methods on the stack, it can be handled within that method. And if a method throws an exception, code execution stops at that point and the stack unwinds until the exception is caught and handled. If the exception is not handled, the common language runtime will handle the exception using a default exception handler. The stack trace information is technical in nature and it is of no interest to the average user of the application. So we certainly do not want to output this information to the user. However, this information can of course be of huge value to technical staff responsible for maintaining the application or to developers of the application during the development phase of the application. So let's test our logger class. Let's force a calculation result overflow exception to occur by multiplying two relatively large integer values together. Great, so let's find our log file so that we can examine the stack trace information that should have been logged. We can navigate to where the log file should have been created by right clicking the project node in our solution explorer window, then clicking the open folder in explorer context menu item. And now we are in the directory where our project file is stored. We can then double click the bin directory, then the debug directory, then the net core app directory. This directory may have a different name on your computer depending on the version of .NET Core you are running. And we can now see our newly created log file we named basiccalculatorlog.txt. And let's double click the text file icon so that we can examine the content of the relevant file. Okay, so why is the log file empty? Oh, I know why. It's because we didn't include code to close the file on a line after the line of code responsible for writing text to the log file. As we have just witnessed, if we don't include code to close the file after the code that writes text to the log file, the text will not be saved to the file. So let's appropriately add code to close the log file. So now that we have corrected the code, let's delete our log file and try again. Great, so now let's examine our log file. And this time, we can see the relevant stack trace information has been logged adjacent to a date timestamp field. Great.
and we can use the stack trace information to examine the lines of code in our code files that were traversed after the exception occurred. So let's look at line 113 of the program.cs file, which is where our code threw the calculation result overflow exception. And then line 36 of the program.cs file, where the calculate method is called in the main method. The information has been collated as the stack unwinds as a result of the occurrence of an exception. Our code is handling the overflow exception in the overflow exception catch block in the calculate method and then throwing a calculation overflow exception up the stack, which is then caught and handled in the main method. At this point, the stack trace information is written to the appropriate log file. Right, so we want to make sure that any exception that could occur in our logger class is appropriately handled. I can recall a few times working as a developer when a piece of code, for example, used for the purpose of accessing a database or a file that would ordinarily work perfectly, one day mysteriously fails. The cause of this was due to a security policy change by the system administrator, where the account under which my application was running suddenly didn't have the appropriate access permissions. This is a scenario over which the developer does not have any control. A systems administrator changes a security setting and inadvertently causes your code in the production environment to fail. The best a developer can do is to anticipate these potential scenarios and handle the exceptions that can be caused under these types of scenarios. So let's force one of these scenarios to occur and see how we can handle this through appropriate exception handling. Let's create a try catch block in our log method. And let's create a catch block to catch an unauthorized access exception. So to force the unauthorized access exception, I'm going to write code that makes the log file read only. So when our code attempts to write to the log file, the unauthorized access exception will be thrown. We'll do this in code by including code before the code that writes to the log file that changes the read only attribute of the log file to be true. So when the subsequent code attempts to write to the log file, an unauthorized access exception will be thrown. Okay, let's test this code. Let's force a calculation result overflow exception to occur so that our exception logging code will be executed. Great, so an unauthorized access exception is caught, which is an expected result. But there's another problem. When the code in our finally method to close the log file is executed, a null reference exception is thrown. So we need to be cognizant of the fact that in the event of an unauthorized access exception occurring, the underscore log file variable, which is of the stream writer data type, will not be instantiated. So the underscore log file variable is referencing a null value at this point. And if we call a method on an object that references a null value, this will result in a null reference exception occurring. So there is an easy way to fix this. All we need to do is include a question mark before the full stop preceding the close method call. And now when we run the code and the calculation result overflow exception occurs, we are handling the unauthorized exception appropriately. We are writing a warning message to the user, which will hopefully result in the issue being reported to the appropriate system administrator. So let's create an overload for the log method. This version of the log method accepts two arguments, one of type exception, and the other is of the enum type we created earlier, where the calling code can pass an indicator to log basic information about an exception by passing the basic enum value to this method, or more detailed information about the exception by passing the verbose enum value to this method. So let's write an if statement to evaluate the value that has been passed into the log type parameter. So if the basic value has been passed in, we only want to log the exception name, the exception message property, and preceding these two values, a date stamp. A 
Else, if the calling code passes in the verbose enum value, then we want to log the exception name, the exception message property, the stack trace property, as well as the inner exception message, if one exists. And then if the exception object is of type argument exception, we also want to log the parameter name of the argument that caused the exception. Let's also include an unauthorized access exception catch block in the try catch block. So let's write code to test our new version of the log method, i.e. the overloaded log method we have just created. Let's go to our main method, and instead of calling the first version of the log method in the event of a calculation result overflow exception occurring, let's call the overloaded log method we have just created and pass in the caught exception object. And let's also indicate that we want verbose logging to occur in this catch block. We can indicate this by passing the log type parameter a value of verbose. Before we run the code, let's make sure that in the finally block of the log method we are about to test, that we are closing the file if the underscore log file object is not null. Remember that if we do not close the file, our text will not be saved to the log file. So let's run the code and force the calculation result overflow exception to occur. Great. And let's see what our log file looks like. And you can see that by choosing the verbose option when logging exception information, that detailed information about the relevant exception is captured in our log file. This data can be very useful when troubleshooting issues in our application. So let's write code to log all exceptions caught in the main method verbosely. Great. I hope you have enjoyed the fourth part of this tutorial on c -sharp exception handling. In the fifth and final part of this tutorial, we'll create validation code for each of the relevant fields, whereby the user is given five attempts to enter valid data for each of the relevant fields. If on the fifth attempt the user enters invalid data, the system will throw and handle the relevant exception. Please like, subscribe, share, and comment. It will be greatly appreciated. And please ring the bell so that you can be notified of future content which will be coming soon. As always, the code in this tutorial can be downloaded from GitHub. Please see a link below in the description to the appropriate GitHub repository. Thank you and take care.